Okay, well, it is 2 p.m. here on my clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Julia Myers, and I'll be your host, and we are coming to you live from the Brooker Creek Preserve Environmental Education Center. For those of you that are unfamiliar with our education center, we are run by both Pinellas County Government and UF IFAS Extension, which is just an extension of the University of Florida to provide research-based education to the public like we are doing today. We're very excited for our program today on insect galls. We've got a very special guest, a good friend of the preserves, Ms. Christine Lennard, and she actually wrote her thesis on the galling insects. And she's got some really fun information to share with us today. And before we get started, I just wanted to let everyone know that we will have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. So please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you've got any question at any point, you can just stick it in there and we will get to all of them at the end. And then if you have a comment or um, a concern, you can go ahead and put that in the chat. And I will be monitoring that throughout the entire presentation um, and we'll be able to communicate with you. And I do want to give a big thank you to our friends group, the Friends of Brooker Creek Preserve. They've graciously sponsored our program this afternoon and all of their efforts go back to supporting what we do here in the Environmental Education Center. So if you are interested in learning more about the Friends or even becoming a member, you can check them out at the friends of Brooker Creek Preserve.org. And I think we've covered all of our basics. So we will go ahead and get started. And I'll turn it over to you, Christine. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Julia. I'm always happy to be here with you guys. All right. So talking about insect galls today. It's one of my favorite topics. Um, I have been studying galls uh, informally for four or five, six years now. And I've, uh, as Julie mentioned, I did do some formal research on it in grad school. And that is where I get most of my uh, expertise on it. And today, I hope that I can give you guys a brief synopsis on what kind of insect galls are out there, um, where you're gonna find them, how they fit into their ecosystems, and in doing so, give you guys little tastes of all biology, chemistry, and history combined. Um, and again, thank you so much for Brooker Creek Preserve and to the Friends Group. I know how magical Friends Groups are to places like Brooker Creek. And so I do hope that you guys uh, uh, check them out and give them your support as well. All right, so let's get started. First of all, I want to whoops, try to not skip too many slides. So first, I just want to give you guys a little bit of background on how I encountered galls, because galls are not typically something that people pay attention to when they're out on a hike or experiencing nature in Florida. Uh, I first found out about galls when I was an undergrad at a place called Little Manatee River State Park, one of my favorite state parks in the area. And I found a weird growth on a tree. You can see the upper right hand corner here. And I just didn't know what it was. And I ended up asking a professor if he knew. And he rightly so assumed that it was just the flower of the oak tree. Uh, and I accepted that for a little while. But then I happened upon a poster in his lab <laughs> uh, that actually explained what a gall was, and I realized that was the exact thing that I was looking at uh, while I was in Little Manatee River State Park. And it just sparked one of the biggest um, love affairs of my life. So I'm happy to share more of this information with you guys. And if you guys are looking for even more information, you can check out this book. This is the Bible of Galls here in Florida. Uh, you can get it from the UF library or on Amazon, I believe. And so if you guys are looking for more information after this presentation, definitely check out Insect Galls in Florida. Okay, so during the talk today, I'll cover a couple topics, but they all boil down to three basic questions. What are galls? What do they do? And galls and humans, match made in history. What's that about? Um, that will include who makes them, information about their life cycles, um, what eats them, 
uh, and how they help other critters in their habitats to also survive, therefore uh, cementing their place in their ecosystem. So let's start off with what are galls? The first big main answer to that is they are part of the host plant. They are homes to insects, but the insects do not actually physically make this uh, um, uh, nursery for their young. Instead, this is host plant tissue that is manipulated to provide uh, shelter and food for developing larvae of the various kinds of bugs that make galls. These galls can be simple swellings of the plant tissue, or they can be complex structures with very specialized features that, that function uh, to enhance protection of the larva or to, um, to alter the chemistry of the gall to reduce fungal infections or such. Now, how do these bugs make the gall in the plant? That is a more complicated question. We're still figuring some of that out, but the basics generally are they use either hormonal control, where they actually inject a hormone cocktail into the plant tissue that then alters the gene expression of the tissue in that area and makes those genes change to the point where they instead produce tissue that benefits the developing bug larva instead of the actual plant itself. There's some um, suspicion that there's also some uh, uh, influence from the actual larvae where when they're chewing on the tissue, they're actually also stimulating some of this growth and changing some of the tissue in that area. Um, but most of the time we think uh, it's usually due to hormonal control that is initiated by the female when she lays her eggs in the plant. <clears throat> the basic gall structure that you'll see if you were to break one open, uh, there's usually three main layers. The first layer, the deepest one inside, is where the larva or the pupa at one point in its uh, life cycle is developing. Uh, the second layer right outside of the actual larva is the kernel wall. And that kernel wall is a, uh, a sealant from the, uh, um, what was the word? From the outside environment. It actually keeps moisture inside. It protects the larva from uh, predators. And that only develops once that larva is starting to pupate. So you can almost think of the kernel wall as a cocoon, a protective cocoon. Now, before that kernel wall develops, the larva has to eat. So the very next layer of the gall is actually the nutritive tissue. And that can be a variety of different textures and densities, um, but the basic uh, uh, use for that is to feed the larva. So there's usually high sugar content early on in the life cycle of the gall. And then as the gall gets older, that nutritive tissue usually hardens a bit, again, as a protective layer against predators. And so the lignin content will increase in the gall. And that lignin is just increasing the toughness of that uh, tissue, makes it harder for either large mammals or other insects to get into the gall. So that's the basic structure of a gall. And remember the gall is part of the plant, not actually a, a what we would think of as a nest or uh, something like that. It's not an egg, it's actually part of the plant, closer to a well-developed and well-planned tumor than anything else. So we know what gall... galls. We see a lot of things on plants that are, and that the, the main rule is unless there is growth, new growth of the plant that's directed by a, uh, a bug, it's not a gall. So if we see leaf roller moths, like in the lower left hand corner of the screen, they're not actually manipulating the growth of the leaf, so they're not a gall or they're not making a gall. 
uh, leaf miners aren't making galls, they're just eating part of the plant on the inside of the leaf. Um, Kermes scales are a tough one. They look just like an oak gall. You'll find these on a couple different species of oaks, but they're actually a very weird little uh, bug, type of scale bug. And what you see here is actually the female's expanded outer body cavity. She actually is sucking uh, uh, nutrition and juices out of the tree. And in the meantime, she's growing her babies inside of that body cavity. And once they're big enough, they actually burst through it and start the cycle over again. So <laughs> cool bug, but not a gall. So let's start getting into uh, the different types of galls you guys would see if you went on a hike at Brooker Creek Preserve, at various state parks around here, any place with a uh, dry scrubby habitat. It's the best place to see galls and one of the most common kinds you'll see are midge galls. So these are flies, very, very small flies. Um, and they will produce a variety of different galls. Um, this is a very common one here on uh, the sand live oak. Polystepha is a very common genus for midges, midge galls here in Florida. About the size of a small pea, just for reference. And come on. Hmm. I'll get it to do. There we go. And uh, these are really great examples of the huge variety of midge galls that you'll see here in Florida. The different species of midges will go after different plant species to lay their eggs on. And so you'll see some species go for goldenrods, some for bald cypress, others for grape. Uh, the bald cypress are some of my favorite. They're very common and you can even break them open, see the little orange midge larvae in there. And it's a really cool way to really see what's going on inside of the gall. And uh, as you can also see, huge variety of form here uh, within this group of galling insects. Aphid galls aren't as common, but they're still around. And uh, you'll see them on hickories most of the time in Pinellas County. Uh, they'll either be in these swollen, um, almost acorn looking growths here, or occasionally they'll be on the outside of the tree, outside of the tissue and be covered in this uh, fluff. That fluff is to deter predators. On the other hand, you see this kind of dusty, uh, water droplet substance here in the middle of this gall on black poplar. That uh, substance there, this is the actual um, uh, developing insect. <laughs> this stuff is its poop. And the reason why it looks so funny is because these critters are sucking the uh, juices and sugars and sap out of the tree and that's what feeds them. And therefore their waste products are very liquidy and since they're enclosed in this system, this gall, if they didn't find a way to uh, tuck away that moisture away from their bodies, they would actually end up drowning in their own waste. So <laughs> if you ever break one open and you see that powdery uh, uh, water droplet substance, <laughs> that is the waste product of the aphid. And uh, very nice up close look at what these guys look like when they're developing. Not the prettiest bugs out there, but definitely still pretty cool. Jumping plant lice are just a little more common than the aphid galls. Uh, you'll see them on Yapon holly, which is a really common ornamental and native plant uh, here in Florida. Fun fact, it's also one of our only plants with, natural, uh, uh, with a natural source of caffeine. Uh, I will also see on hackberry, the Pachycyla uh, genus is common on hackberries. And this is one of those galls that's so tough, you can't even break into it unless you have um, garden shears or something like that. And so uh, that is the defense strategy for this gall. It's just very tough. Other galls just try to be inconspicuous. You will occasionally see them on bays as well. And unfortunately, this is one of the only galls that I see 
and these galls are the, the leaf rolled, the, the um, swollen rolled looking part of this leaf. It actually is caused by these little guys, again with the powdery poop. And unfortunately, these are the only galls that I really see that look like they really do inhibit the health of the tree. And that is more of a problem because our bay trees are already struggling with other insect attacks. And so it's usually one that I watch out for. There's nothing you can do about it. It takes its uh, toll on its own, but it's interesting to me that that is the only gall that I see that seems to do serious damage to its host plant. You'd think there'd be more instances of that. Mite galls are very common right now. We are actually just exiting the season for mite galls here in Pinellas County. And I see it most often on poison ivy. <laughs> uh, luckily it does make poison ivy just a touch more obvious with these little red galls that you see, almost wart-like in appearance. But you'll also see them on willows and on elms. The elms aren't as obvious, but the willows are nice and bright pink. And these guys are very, very small. They're actually not insects, they are mites. And so a microscopic look is actually a better idea of what it looks like. But sometimes it's these wart-like growths and sometimes it's a simple tube-like gall. And uh, so these are very common ones you'll see here in Pinellas, uh, early spring and into the summer. And finally, this is my favorite group of galling insects, wasp galls. Uh, these were the galls that I did my research on, so I know more about these guys. And I really, really adore, as you can see with these photos here, just how diverse in structure, size, texture, color, uh, everything that these galls are. This is a very specialized group of bugs, and their survival strategies are incredible. So let's get into it. The family that these wasps belong to is called cynipidae or cynipidae, and people usually just call them cynipids or cynipids, depending on your pronunciation. Uh, there's 41 genera worldwide, 1,000 species included in those genera. And here in Florida, right now, the total count is at 66 species here in Florida. And I say right now because that count was from back in 2004. And due to uh, taxonomic uh, revisions or new discoveries, I think that number has probably changed. Whether it's gone up or down is another question. And that's because these guys have very interesting life cycles that I'll explain in a second. And depending on uh, the species, we may have over-described some and under-described others. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, when you're looking for gall wasps, you're really gonna look for the oak trees. They parasitize corpus species, oak species. You'll find some on rose species, blackberry species, and smilax species, but the vast majority are on oaks, and they're usually pretty easy to find once you know what you're looking for. And finally, the coolest thing about their gall wasps particular um, uh, survival strategy is they have two generations per year. And I'll go into much more detail on that after we go over some of the common species that you'll see. All right, so let's start off with Amphibolops murata, the oak apple gall. I'm going to call most of these guys by their scientific name, mostly just because most of them don't have common names. Uh, not sure why, but probably just because a lot of people don't know about them, so they don't assign them common names. But I always prefer the scientific name anyway. So Amphibolops murata, it's pretty common. You're gonna find them on the red oaks, the myrtle oak, shrub oak, laurel oak, black blue jack. All of these oak species can be found in scrubby areas. Scrubby meaning high, dry, well-drained, sandy soil and a lot of these scrub oak species that I'll mention throughout all of this uh, uh, information really thrive in that type of habitat. So you'll see grows on the um, 
the bud tissue of the flower or of the uh, growing stem. And it has this very intricate web system that actually suspends the kernel and the larva within the middle of the gall. And that is purely for defensive reasons. There are other bugs, other wasps that want to get into that larva. And we'll go over that more later, but that is the reason for such a complex structure for this gall. And you really only see that in this genus as well. Andricus quercus foliatus. This is the first gall that I ever knew to be a gall. Um, it's about an inch long, sometimes a little smaller. And you can see that it's covered in these rosettes of leaf-like structures. Uh, and what is happening here is that when the gall wasp is manipulating the genes for this gall, is actually manipulating the genes that were intended to grow the flower of the tree. So that's why this gall looks a bit like a flower. That's what those genes were originally meant for. And you'll find these guys on live oak and sand live oak. Um, they will produce these really cool little ladies uh, in the uh, uh, springtime. You'll see these galls over wintertime. And uh, the wasp here, just for perspective, is smaller than a grain of rice. And so these wasps are not <laughs> any danger to us. Uh, they cannot sting and they actually don't even feed uh, while they're adults. Once they're adults, it's just uh, uh, reproduce and you're done. Uh, so they spend most of their life inside the gall. Andricus quercus lanigera, instead of being uh, on the bud tissue of the plant, this gall is on the mid vein of sand live oak especially, but sometimes live oak as well. And instead of a rosette of leafy structures around the kernel to protect it, this gall has uh, almost hair-like filaments coming out of it to keep those predators off. And I just think it's one of the most distinctive species you'll see around here. A, a very, very cool little gall. Another Andricus species, this one is Quercus petiolicola, and uh, named so because it's on the petioles, the leaf stems of quercus species. Uh, these are very tough galls, so their defense strategy is just in being very hard to, to break into. And you'll see them on a, this species, on a wider variety of oak species. Not as common, but you can still see it on Chapman's oak especially. One of the most common species is this Bellinocnema orcus virens, a, a pea-like gall that starts off very small, uh, going from white to red, and then finally to brown as it matures. They're very papery, very soft, almost defenseless in many ways. And so these guys depend on uh, quantity and not quality of gall. They reproduce uh, very rapidly. And so you'll see a lot of them on the same tree. And yet I still don't see these galls really hurting the health of the tree. So it's interesting to see how um, the, the, this parasite, because these are parasitic uh, uh, galls here, don't seem to be hurting the tree too much, which is very good. The oak apple gall, very pretty gall, starts off um, with a beautiful red and yellow type of color, and then it dries out to a brown once it's older. You can actually see where the uh, fully developed wasp uh, emerged, chewed its way out of the gall. And these galls will stay on the trees for a long time. So you'll actually still see uh, galls from several years past sticking on that tree. And I'll talk about this a little later, but you'll also find little critters living in those old galls, which is really cool. These galls are super tough. Uh, it's, it's incredible how hard that the wood actually becomes through the lignification process as that lignin increases. And uh, I would doubt even a squirrel would try to break into these guys. On the other hand, the strategy for Dishal caspis fungiosa not in, is not to get tough, but to get large. 
And so there's a lot of this uh, spongy material, spongy nutritive tissue uh, that grows outside of the gall and just increases the distance between potential predators and the kernel developing here inside of the uh, spongy tissue. And uh, I just absolutely adore this cross section of the gall where you can actually see the developing wasp inside. And you can see that it's only one uh, individual inside the skull. Some galls can have multiple wasps uh, developing in each uh, gall itself and others just do one. So depending on the strategy, uh, the number of wasps inside will change, uh, as you can see here. <laughs> and these guys are on Chapman's oak, live oak, sand live oak, dwarf live oak. I've only seen them on um, Chapman's oak though, but keep your eye out. Now these guys are a little more inconspicuous than the spongiosa species. This is Calaritis corcus batatoides, uh, sometimes called just a potato gall, um, since they can look a lot like raw potato on the inside. And this is one of those species that has multiple larvae within the same gall, called polythalamus, as opposed to monothalamus. And these guys aren't very complex. It's basically just nice juicy nutritive tissue for the uh, larvae to eat and then the bark of the tree. Not much protection there, um, but it is a pretty tough tissue. So uh, it can be a little hard to break into, but I, I see small bite marks uh, breaking into these guys every now and then. Now, sometimes when you're looking at galls, you need to know which oak species you're looking at, which isn't the easiest thing all the time. Uh, but one example of that being important is there is a species called Eumeria floridana uh, that is on completely different oak species than Calaritis quercus batatoides, but they look completely similar. <laughs> There's really no way to tell the difference just from the gall. You got to be able to know which uh, oak species you're looking at. Um, so it's always a good idea to brush up on your oaks. All right. Trigonaspis polita, one of the prettiest galls that you're ever going to see, and find it on Chapman's oak and post oak. And these guys are usually on top of the leaf, attached to the mid vein. Um, these are papery and delicate. And again, just trying to uh, increase the distance between the outside of the gall and the kernel with the larva in it. And uh, they don't stick on the tree for very long. Uh, but they're absolutely beautiful when you can find one just like this. It's almost like a Christmas scene. <laughs> Finally, uh, this, is, this is our second to last slide on the different species we'll see. But these are another example of species that are very hard to distinguish unless you know your oak species. So here on the left-hand side, we get Neuroteris corcus minutissimus. And you'll find those on sand live oaks and live oaks and dwarf live oaks. Um, and you know, both of them are basically small, round, fuzzy growths on the bottom of the leaf. The fuzz is to protect them from predators and also to probably protect them from getting too hot. Um, Neuroteris quercus ferricarum, on the other hand, is on Chapman's oak and sand post oak and post oak and such. Um, so again, just another reason to kind of brush up on your oak species. I know it's not the easiest uh, group of trees to distinguish, but once you get it, you pretty much get it. All right, final species that we'll go over, but luckily I can show you guys just how cool this species is. Not to say that other species aren't cool, but this is the only one that we really know the full life cycle of. Well, I shouldn't say the only one. Uh, there's been a little more work done on determining the full life cycle of more gall species, gall wasp species, um, but still few and far between. So this is one of the first ones that we knew of that we had pieced all of it together. And if you wanna read more detail about it, go see the original paper. These are amazing researchers and they did awesome work. Um, and I'm really pleased to show you guys exactly how this wasp survives the whole year with varying levels of resources to take advantage of. So let's start with the asexual female. She emerges in the springtime. 
she is able to lay eggs without mating. Uh, they are genetic clones of herself, but she finds a little uh, uh, wedge in the bud tissue of the sand live oaks or live oaks. And the gall that she creates for her, for her eggs is just the size of a grain of rice. It's very flimsy, but it's very well hidden, which is why it escaped our knowledge for a long time. Now, when this gall hatches in uh, the late summer, out comes sexual females and sexual males. So these guys are able to actually mate. They get that nice genetic mixing. Uh, it helps the species survive uh, through a few more mutations that are able to happen through uh, sexual reproduction. And those guys induce the winter gall on the same species of tree, sand live oaks and live oaks. These galls survive the winter, they get very, very tough, and they're able to retain a lot of moisture so that they don't dry out over winter. And then in the spring, out comes the asexual female again. So this is the cycle that goes over and over. Now, why do they have to do that? Well, the running hypothesis is that when the asexual female emerges from the gall in the springtime, the early springtime, February, maybe January, there's not a lot of resources to go around. As you guys probably know, in, in Florida, our dry season is in the wintertime. There's not a lot of fresh growth during the winter. So when the asexual females come out, they don't have a lot of time to, to be picky, to spend finding the best resources, to spend finding a mate. Uh, she can't dilly-dally. So she finds the first available uh, fresh bud tissue that she can, and she just goes ahead and lays eggs. No males needed. And the advantage of that is simply the convenience of it. But at the same time, for a species to completely abandon sexual reproduction could mean that it doesn't get the right amount of genetic mutations that helps it to continue evolving to new uh, conditions. So there's a compromise. When the summer gall hatches, the sexual male and sexual female wasps have a lot more resources and they have a little more time to choose a good spot to lay their eggs. They can find mates. Um, they're, they're able to spend a little more time getting it right. And so they're able to mate. They get more of that genetic mixing uh, that's healthy for the species. And in so doing, these two generations take full advantage of the resources they have available and <laughs> make an incredibly interesting uh, life cycle for us to have pieced together. And I, I really appreciate, the, again, these researchers finally nailing this one down for us because it's just fascinating. And we think all gall wasps have somewhat similar life cycles. We just can't find a lot of the summer generations, possibly because a lot of those summer galls could actually be on the roots of the tree. <laughs> and not a lot of researchers are looking to uproot tons of scrub oaks just to find some galls that we think might be there. Now, moving away from the individual species that you'll see and more into how gall wasps fit into their ecosystem fit into their communities of bugs and plants. First of all, there's several different threats for these gall wasps. Um, organisms play in their system is this, a couple of different types of critters. First one is called inquilines. The inquilines are bugs that live inside of the gall with the gall wasp. We don't think they intend to harm the gall wasp, but the, they may unintentionally do it. Um, but in any uh, uh, effect, they also just eat part of the gall. As you can see with the Florida oak gall moth here, you can see how it's eaten the inside of one of these galls, and this is all frass. 
uh, whether it ate the gall wasp as well <laughs> is another question. Um, but usually the inquilines are other wasps that have lost their ability to make their own gall, or in some of these rare cases, a moth like this. What's more common are parasitoid wasps. Uh, while a parasite uses a host to, to survive, a parasitoid invariably kills its host to survive. Usually only takes one host as well. And down here on the right hand side is an example of a parasitoid wasp injecting its own egg into the larva of the gall wasp inside the gall. Uh, a really interesting species of parasitoid wasp is Euderis set, the crypt keeper wasp. I'll talk about that in a second. Finally though, we also have plain old predators, birds, small mammals and such that break into the gall, get that little meat nugget in the middle of the gall, that is the uh, larva, or sometimes parasitic plants like the love vine. We're starting to see some instances of the love vine, Cassitha filiformis, actually parasitizing the galls as well as the tree that they're on. Now, back to Euderis set for a little bit. This wasp is a parasite on the gall wasp, parasitoid on the gall wasp, and so it finds a gall wasp and actually injects its own egg next to the gall wasp larva. Doesn't eat the larva, it just eats the gall along with the larva. When the gall wasp finally hatches, it has actually been uh, uh, manipulated to, instead of burrowing a hole big enough to fit its whole body out of and escaping the gall and going and doing its own gall wasp thing, it is instead now under mind control from a chemical uh, stimulant from the original uh, uh, female Euderis set wasp to still burrow a hole to the outside of the gall, but make it just too small. Instead, it's stuck in that hole. So, and leave behind the empty gall with the um, uh, wasp tunnel that it left behind. <laughs> Quite a graphic uh, uh, life cycle, but we think this actually happens a lot with tons of different species that do similar things to what Euderis set is doing, um, but we're still learning a lot about it. Now, what other kind of bugs interact with these galls? Usually you see ants playing the primary role of, uh, of, of neighbor, of inhabitant, of protector for these galls. Um, you can see in some galls, the ants will actually burrow out tunnels and they'll actually use those galls as nests. A little ant colony will live inside one single gall. Um, and there's many, many species of ants, and usually it's the arboreal species, the tree-dwelling species that end up living in these galls, and it provides excellent homes for those ants. In return, as you can see in this uh, bottom picture here, uh, the gall, well, actually, let me explain this one first. Here you see the gall actually secreting this kind of fuzzy white powdery substance. That's actually a sugary substance designed to attract ants. Same thing as down here, except these are actually the full kernels of the gall wasp. So the gall wasp is right in here and it's secreting nectar from the top of the gall. And again, attracting ants. These ants in turn, protect the gall from predators like the parasitoid wasps. Uh, now, what's extra interesting about that interaction is typically we think of galls as parasitic to the tree. These are uh, growths that are just sucking the, the, the resources from the tree, shouldn't really be helping the tree survive. Well, in the cases where the galls attract ants to protect the gall, 
those ants inadvertently also protect the tree from herbivores, usually insect herbivores. And we've actually demonstrated through uh, uh, different research that when you have galls that attract ants on an oak tree, you actually get fewer herbivores eating that oak tree. So sometimes it actually might be more of a mutualistic relationship between the galls and the trees instead of just parasitic. A little more simple is the relationship between spiders and moths and beetles and such uh, with, with the galls. You'll often find uh, these little critters growing or living inside of the empty galls that the wasps have already left behind. And so they're probably very important um, microhabitat sources for these critters. And I would be very interested to see more people look into uh, just how important their role is in that uh, job. All right. Now, <laughs> to one of my favorite topics, uh, galls and humans have been uh, uh, interacting with each other for thousands of years. Now, the word gall comes from uh, bitterness of spirit or rancor. And you'd understand that if you popped one of those galls in your mouth, which I don't recommend doing, but it's not going to kill you. Uh, it'll be very bitter if you actually taste it. And that is because it's filled with tannic acids or tannins. Those are the same things that make wine and coffee and tea bitter and, and dark. And it's actually there for a really important reason in the gall. Uh, being part of the wood, uh, the gall is actually susceptible to fungal attacks and the high tannic acid content in the gall inhibits the fungal growth. Now that's worked out very well for us humans because now that we know about those high tannic acid levels, we've been using galls for making dyes and tanning leather and even as primitive medicines, astringent medicines to help close up wounds for thousands of years. But the most important thing we've used it for is for making ink. So iron gall ink was first made in around the first century. Pliny the Elder was actually the first to write about iron gall ink. And the importance of that ink came from the tannic acid. The tannic acid allowed the ink to bind to the paper. Now to make tannic or to make a iron gall ink it was actually very easy. You used the galls as a source of tannic acid and that is what actually made the ink permanent uh, and then you used ferrous sulfate for the actual pigment, the black pigment of the ink um, and that's the same thing that we use for treating iron deficiency anemia today so it's it's food safe. Uh, it was easy to get uh, even a long time ago because it's a byproduct of the iron ore mining process. And it was pretty cheap. So people were doing this at home for their own writing ink. And it was groundbreaking because it was our first permanent ink. Um, before that, almost all of the inks used in the West were carbon-based. And because they were carbon-based, just like our modern day graphite pencils, they could be erased, they could be smudged, um, they could be washed off. Iron gall ink being the first permanent ink was so crucial to writing important documents that you didn't want to be changed later on. And so we actually used iron gall ink to write the Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence, uh, and even the Constitution. Uh, so if you are a history buff, you better say thanks to your uh, wasp galls one of these days. And in case anybody's interested, it's actually really easy to make iron gall ink at home to this day. Now you have to find your own galls and you can't take it from public lands. <laughs> so make sure you get your galls either online, try to get it from a sustainable so uh, source though, or you can start to monitor your local oak trees, maybe the one in your backyard, you and start collecting a few every now and then. And uh, when it's time to make ink, you just get some distilled water and you crush those galls up, let them ferment in that water for uh, three days at least. That increases the tannic acid content. 
Uh, and once that's fermented and it's sat in the sun, you can strain all the bits out with cheesecloth, add your iron, add your gum arabic as a thickener. Gum arabic is actually in um, tons of different foods today. It's just sap from a tree, but it's been used for thousands of years for the same uh, uses. And bing, bang, boom, you've got your own iron gall ink. And uh, to be fair, it's quite a messy little craft, but it is really fun. So if you guys have access to some oak galls from your local trees, uh, give it a whirl. It's a really fun little project. Here are examples of uh, uh, iron gall ink in use. Uh, Germany actually used iron gall ink for its official government documents until the 1980s. So you can see this uh, cert marriage certificate from 1952. And on the other side, you see the downside of iron gall ink. Considering that tannic acid is what is actually binding the ink to the paper, it's no surprise that that acid does eventually eat away at the paper. And so historical conservators and uh, document conservators uh, really struggle with the damage that iron, all, iron gall ink does over several hundred years. You know, it's pretty stable for a long time. But we still have these issues with uh, these important old documents to this day. So just as a quick recap, lots of different insects can induce galls on plants. And it can be a wide variety of plants as well. Uh, galls are a very important part of their ecosystem. Even if we don't always notice them, they're usually there and they're usually providing some kind of resource to other uh, members of their ecosystem. Gall wasps in general are pretty rad. Uh, they're a really diverse family of wasps uh, with incredibly complex life cycles, and they in turn support a ton of different other species with their galls. Um, and finally, humans love oak galls. So uh, next time you're out walking, especially at Brooker Creek Preserve, Maybe just find an oak tree and take a little look under the leaves. Uh, see what you find. And I think you guys will find something interesting. And I hope you share it with us uh, next time we do a talk about galls here at Brooker Creek. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. I uh, always enjoy talking about galls and I am looking forward to any questions you've got. Thank you, Christine. That was amazing as always. I thank learned a you. lot. Um, so if anyone has any questions now is the time to put them in the Q&A box and we do have a couple so we will get started. Right. Our first one, Christine, is um, this was from the very beginning of the presentation um, and it's from Heather Charles and if you want to clarify Heather please feel free to um, but the question is is that the swelled part of a goldenrod stalk? Uh, um, yes I can okay. go back up to that picture so she can get a good look. I have no problem with moving around the presentation just for the pictures because I know they're really nice and pretty. They are beautiful pictures. And uh, some of these are from the internet, but they are uh, usually with the Creative Commons license, so no problem. But so I try to get my own. And you can see that this gall, this is a midge gall, Schizomyia racemicola. Ugh. Some of these names are very fun to pronounce, but these galls are actually developing on the flower bud uh, tissue. Uh, so she is correct. That is just a swollen part of the bud of the goldenrod. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And next question, are avian predators like birds able to eat the galls um, or are they too hard? And that, that was before you did talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I don't see a ton of galls. I'll just go back to the one with the bite taken out of it. This is what I usually see um, where it's basically a gall that's half chewed um, and you can see that the, the larvae is gone. This is an older gall though. I think most of them are eaten by small mammals if they're eaten by vertebrates at all, uh, but I would think small woodpecker species would probably take pretty good advantage of these guys. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. And we did have a comment earlier that um, someone did say that chickadees love 
goals. So that's good to know. Oh, perfect. Um, there is a question. Are we able to get a copy of the PowerPoint? I'm not sure if that's something um, you're comfortable with, Christine, but we will be putting a recording of this presentation up mm -hmm. on our YouTube channel. Um, and it's also on our Facebook page as well. Mm -hmm. And I would really recommend people, uh, I'll switch to that photo again, uh, go check out this book. It's not an expensive book. Um, it's what I learned my goals from. There's almost no resources out there for the goals of Florida. This is it. This is the only book. And um, some things have been updated since this book was published. But the researchers who wrote this book are at the forefront of what we know about Gauls. So this is the best resource I can give you. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And do you know of any farming or culturing of Gauls um, that's taking place for purposes such as making the ink? And then also as a follow up, you mentioned the potato gall. Are any Gauls edible by humans? Ah, the first question, I'm really not sure if there's any farming but there are industries around it um for centuries the best gall for making ink was considered to be the aleppo gall which is a, a very hard uh maybe the size of a quarter gall um from syria from oak species that grow in that part of the world and um you can still buy those on Amazon to this day. And so there must still be a harvesting industry for that species of gall. But I tend to really try to collect my own um, only because I do worry about the ecological impacts that could occur from over harvesting galls. Um, but do your own research on that. And if you find a, a good source for it, that's great. I know a lot of people who actually do crafts with galls and they will often get them from friends and family who have these oaks and they get them shipped to them as gifts and things like that. And so it's more of a, maybe a community industry here in the US. Um, now on whether any of them are edible, none of them would kill you if you ate them, but none of them are gonna taste good. <laughs> they, um, like I said, they're very bitter, um, but they really have been used uh, either as a almost a tea-like, uh, you know, you kind of soak the gall in water or you crush the gall up and that liquid has a lot of the tannic acid in it and the tannic acid helps to close up wounds, very small wounds. So don't eat it and be careful with medical uses of it, but that is the historical use of those galls. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and do oak galls have to be freshly harvested or can you use the ones that have been on the ground for a while? How long Got do you it. save the galls to make your own ink? Got it. Perfect question. Uh, the old saying is that the fresher the better uh, for making ink. They actually used to prefer galls that still had the wasp inside. Now for purposes of making sure you have galls for in the future, I would always recommend take old galls and you can use galls on the ground, no problem. Um, I made ink with some summer camp kids last year and we just used whatever galls we found and it worked perfectly. So it was great. Plus it's fun for kids. They get to smash them up with hammers and whatnot. It's fun. <laughs> I was just thinking what a great youth activity. Okay, yeah. we've got one more question here. Um, in the North Boston on Red Oaks, can you talk for a second of what kind of galls um, and then would tobacco smoke deter galls and do the galls hurt trees? Mm. I think that's the end of the question. So, Thank you. <laughs> they found my Achilles heel here. I only know Florida galls. <laughs> I really don't know uh, anything outside of Florida oak species. Um, all of my uh, own personal education has been in Florida-based stuff. So you might have to find someone based up in the Northeast to tell you about the galls up there. Um, but there definitely are galls across the world. Uh, um, lots of different ones in England as well. There's, so there's more research out of England uh, than a lot of other areas in the world. But I mean, there are thousands of species worldwide, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. You tend to see them a little more in the um, in the north for some reason. Um, 
uh, the question about whether they hurt the tree. I, gall wasps, I've never seen make a significant impact on their host plants. Some of the other galls, yes, it can definitely make an impact, but it's not something you have to worry about. I don't think tobacco smoke would do much to deter uh, the gall wasps. And um, it's really just not anything that you need to control. It's just something cool that happens on your tree that you can watch and enjoy. Did I miss a question there? <laughs> no, you got it. Thank you. Okay. And then we've just got lots of comments saying thank you. Um, and what a great presentation and how interesting it was. And I couldn't agree more. So I think that's all we've got today for questions. Thank you so much for joining us, Christine. And again, talking about such a cool subject that we know so little about. It's it's so fun to, um, you know, these little tiny things that we barely notice when we're on hikes have such a rich history and so much to them. So thank you for joining us. Thank you everyone for tuning in and caring to learn about golf with us today. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their week and thank you so much. Thank you guys. <laughs>